today is ecosystem restoration, primarily calling us to reimagine Okay. Yes, primarily calling us to reimagine, recreate, and restore. Indeed, we are at a crucial juncture where humanity is literally left grasping for breath, searching for means to breathe uh, through cylinders at times. Uh, for years, we have depleted our natural resources at will, we've denuded our Mother Earth of our vitality and polluted our surroundings, had taken everything so lovingly bestowed on us for granted. We have finally realized that no amount of concrete structures can resuscitate us. Only nature can restore and revive. On the eve of the World Environment Day, we have gathered here to talk about some of the challenges uh, facing the environment today and understand, as the UN uh, puts it, whether we have it in us to become hashtag generation restoration and not just in social media. To address our session today, we have someone who has perhaps dedicated his whole life in creating a greener, cleaner, pollution-free environment, Dr. Kullan Rudro, Chairman of Pollution Control Board and it would not be wrong to say Dr. Rudro had spearheaded the state's war against pollution, not just the state, the country as well. He's uh, presently the chairman of West Bengal Pollution Control Board and former member of the Central Pollution Control Board. He is a geographer by academic training, having specialization in river and water management. He took a break from protracted teaching career in 2007 and involved in research on water resources and on dynamic river system of West Bengal. He has been the expert member in the committee constituted by the Apex Court of the State for cleaning the Ganga since 2005. Dr. Rudro was a member of the National Flood Management Core Group and head of the committee constituted to advise government of West Bengal on the issue of Indo-Bangladesh sharing of Tisa water. He had been a member of the consortium of IITs which uh, submitted the Ganga River Basin Management Plan to the Government of India in 2015 as well. Well, not just that, he is a prolific writer, constantly researching, constantly writing about issues that need our attention. He has written, edited five uh, books and many research papers, also worked for the International Union for Conservation of nature to prepare Indo-Bangladesh transboundary river atlas. He has worked on the history of mapping Bengal during the colonial period and edited a Bengal atlas, which, is compiled, which was compiled by James Reynolds in 1780. Dr. Rudro's The River of Ganga Brahmaputra Meghna Delta came out in 2018. He was most recently published a book, Dui Banglar Nodi Katha, and his uh, publishing also a book uh, uh, regarding Shundarman, which will come out very shortly. And also been working on river and economy of colonial Bengal. Extensive experience, extensive work area, so much research. We are extremely fortunate to, that he's agreed to address our session, taking our time from his very busy schedule. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruto. We will be taking questions, I'm sure, in the audience. Uh, Everybody wants to ask him some, uh, some things or the other. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the session. Kindly drop your questions in the chat box. Kindly keep your microphones on mute, but you can keep your radio on. Uh, we will soon start the session and the address of Dr. Rudra. But before that, I would request uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Dhrubodjyoti Chattopadhyay to uh, give the welcome address. Sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, let me first, on behalf of the Sister Nivedita University, one of the youngest university, private university in the uh, state, uh, in the name of a person who actually fought for the environment, not only 
the environment environment which includes cultural which includes social which includes everything and i'm really grateful and feeling honored to have with us a very revered friend of mine professor kollan mitra professor rudra uh, and myself we actually i think we have uh, met several times in several committees and in several conferences and in all the cases i could i was really all always mesmerized with his uh, deliberations being an expert river expert i think one of the most important thing what he actually uh, made a huge contribution in the geomorphology because the geomorphology studies is being spearheaded by him and he did a huge amount of research in that area which you mentioned about the water resource management definitely he did a lot but professor rutro i must uh, uh, mention to you that even during the pandemic you actually published articles in uh, several journals and one of the article which you published in november 2020 uh, which is on analysis of pollution pattern in regions of the uh, kolkata uh, over there actually you have demonstrated that how from the data collected from the state as well as the central pollution board you actually worked on it and analyzed it in such a nice way that gives a huge importance to the uh, whole process now you always uh, used to write very important chapters which already mentioned by oindrila but in today's time when right up to the i ila and yes the book chapters on combating the flood and erosion in the lower ganga pan in india some unexplored uh, issues in that article he actually predicted so many different things which we can see right now turned out to be a reality he always tried to generate constructive and sustainable alternatives to meet the challenges of development of the ganga system andira you also mentioned about his contribution in the ganga bhumiputra meghnas delta we call it gbm delta and the flood in the gbm delta evolution of the bengal basin sundarbans river of the tarai dwars and also what we could see that the jamuna meghna system are worth mentioning his remarkable writing on the conflicts over sharing the water of trans boundaries rivers pointed out various important aspects in one of his lecture i just came to know about that the changing river courses in the western pool ghat part of the ganga uh bangladesh delta uh, ganga brahmaputra delta now this changing um, uh, river courses very important issues which must be dealt with uh, a lot of importance the type of projects he handled i i find that one of the project where he used the statistical application in environmental problems in that type of projects he made a huge contribution at uh, the administering of this transdisciplinary uh, subject areas geography statistics and everything coming together is a real contribution on this eve of the world environment day when we are talking about the bio restoration a person like him is i think one of the most important suitable as well as the um, we are really feeling fortunate to have him uh, today thank you sir for accepting our invitation and we feel honored for your presence in today's lecture thank you namaskar 
Right. He is indeed. Uh, we are extremely grateful. And uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for that welcome address. And uh, now for now, the most awaited uh, uh, speech from and address from uh, Dr. Rudro. Uh, sir, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, uh, Inula, uh, yes. Uh, yes. May I share my screen right at this moment? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, you can. Am I, am I audible? Am I audible? Absolutely. Fine. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. Uh, is it clear, Vaidhulina? Yes, yes, it's clear, okay. it's enlarged okay. and it's, okay. it's on okay. the screen. We can uh, see. Let me start. Uh, respected uh, my very good friend, Professor Chattopadhyay, Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, this university, uh, respected Ina Bos, Professor Ina Bos, Madam, and Vaidhulina started very nicely. And I understand my dear students are uh, beyond my screen. Uh, uh, I really, it is a proud privilege for me to share my experience uh, on the eve of this World Environment Day. Uh, in the rightly pointed out, I joined the West Bengal Pollution Control Board uh, in, in uh, 1st November 2014, uh, leaving behind about more than 33 decades of my teaching experience. Uh, but what I miss every day is my classroom and my dear students. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Chattopadhyay and Ina Madam, uh, so giving me a chance to interact with my dear students. Uh, uh, today's topic uh, is, as decided by the uh, UNEP, is the ecosystem restoration. I have divided the, uh, my lecture into two parts. First will be the uh, issues of ecosystem restoration. And in the second part, I will focus largely on Sundarbon. And I will try to share what happened in, in on la, uh, last uh, 26 uh, over Sundarbon and what had been the causes behind it. So this ecosystem restoration uh, is uh, most important to us. We we are uh, living in an ecosystem. We are we are uh, taking the ingredient of our survival from of the ecosystem. But the rich biodiversity of the, of the earth is being lost at alarming rate, and this loss affects our own health and well-being. Today, catastrophic impact of people and planet loom closer. It appears clearly that we are in a crisis. Mm. I start with Rockstorm. Rockstorm is a famous ecologist, environmental scientist. He published a paper in 2009 in Nature, a very brief paper uh, with a group of his uh, colleagues he published. He said, uh, I, I, first I go back to the next slide. This is that. He said, we are living in an ecosystem where there's a planetary boundaries. The topic of the title of his paper was a safe operating limit of the mankind, humanity. He said there are nine planetary boundaries within which we are living. He started with atmospheric aerosol load loading, ocean acidification, global fresh water use, chemical pollution, land system change, biodiversity change, biological, uh, biogeochemical loading, etc., etc. Out of these nine planetary limits, he said that yes, we, we have already transgressed in case of three planetary limits. First one, he mentioned about the biodiversity loss. Second one, he mentioned about the nitrogen cycle. And third one, he mentioned about the climate change. Uh, it is in 2009, about say 12 years back, situation has further aggravated, I understand. And when I look at our country, it is really, really, it appears to be really alarming. So, Rockstone may mentioned that there is this safe operating limit of the humanity has already been transgressed. 
before, oh, in uh, if my memory serves in light, uh, right? I I wrote I, I read this paper, uh, this this book, the Making Peace with the Planet by Barry Commoner. He was a physicist and subsequently became ecologist. He said there are four laws of ecology which governs our existence. The first law is saying in this ecosystem, everything is connected to everything else. Humans and other species are connected, dependent on a number of other species. So we are connected. We are living in It has to go somewhere. Whatever we, we produce uh, in our production system, there is a waste. So waste all must go somewhere. It is a dynamic system. We must keep in mind it is not a static system. The third law is very close to my heart. He said, the nature knows the best. Nature knows the best kind of engineering. Don't interrupt nature. It all system, nature is delicately balanced. The, natural world is inspiring a new innovation and scientists learn from nature the best ideas and generate breakthrough and products and technologies. So this third law of ecology is very close to my heart. The fourth law, there is nothing called, he said, free lunch. Everything has a consequences. Whatever you do, our disconnection with nature, one major reason of this COVID pandemic, we just shattered our civilization, is also identified as our disconnectivity from the nature. Everything you do must have a reason behind it. And you have to do something in order to get something. The global ecosystem is connected whole in which nothing can be gained or nothing can be lost. So this, I, I start with these four laws of ecology and then Combining our ecosystem is crumbling. The global economic growth in the last half a century has changed our world such a way that our health, our knowledge, standard of living obviously has improved. But the stress on nature is, seems to be enormous. Yet, this has become a huge cost to nature. The stability of the Earth's operating system that sustains us the population size of the mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles have been alarmingly dropping uh, about 68% since 1970. You keep in mind when human population are ever increasing uninterruptedly, the population size of the mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, and reptiles have seen an alarming average of drop of 68%. This is from the latest report of the WWF, what they call Living Planet Report. It is clearly, the, the experts have identified, agriculture is responsible for 80% of the global deforestation. I was working on the colonial mapping of Bengal. I, it, it, was, it was James Reynolds' Bengal Atlas, which was published in 1780. And if you look back to the, on that atlas, the large part of the Bengal was covered under forest. Say Sundarbon was extended even up to south of Kolkata. The Chotanagpur Plateau uh, was entirely covered with the forest, what we described subsequently as Jungle Mahal, and the North Bengal foothills regions and Himalayan slope was covered with. And, and now, if you look at this latest uh, satellite image, the, the forest is hardly 14% of the total geographical area of West Bengal. Agriculture accounts for the 70% of this fresh water use. And if you consider the case of India, it is 80% of the annual fresh water use or water we are consuming, it is 85% of, of Indian consumption is in agriculture sector. Food production causes 50% of the fresh water biodiversity loss and food system releases 29% of the global greenhouse gases. Drivers linked with food production cause 70% of the terrestrial biodiversity loss. And right at this moment, 52% of the agricultural land is declared as degraded. 
that means they are losing their natural uh, reproductive capacity. Globally, more than 820 million people face hunger or food insecurity. While staggering quantities of the food loss and waste result in US dollar 1 trillion in economic cost and around US dollar 700 billion is the environmental cost and around 900 dollar billion is the social cost. So these are the hunger and cost and our food production system are all linked together. And now I talk about the ecological footprint. Our ecological footprint is ever increasing. The global average sustainable limit was identified or fixed by the expert. It should be about 1.7 global hectare per capita per human being. But globally right at this moment, it has exceeded 2.8 global hectare per capita and it is ever increasing. So how we are surviving? It is the natural capital stock which is being fast degraded. I mean, our groundwater resource, our river, our forest cover, everything. Four areas are seriously impacted. One is definitely our air. Second one is the land. Third one is the water. And, and the fourth one is the biodiversity. Uh, Right at this moment, scientists have says that ecological footprint shows that 1.5 Earth will be, would be required to meet the demands of the humanity that makes on nature to each year. It reminds me of Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, long back, uh, probably the year was 1934, he wrote that he was referring to the, uh, the protonous consumption of the European style. He was talking about the Great Britain. He said that May God forbid India be industrialized in the manner of waste. Uh, a tiny island kingdom has put the entire world in chain to con for its consumerism. If India consumes in the manner of the waste, the whole earth will be bare like locust. Banglai bolle hoy, ni bolchenge, Harod borsho jodi Europe er moto consume korte aranombo kore, tali whole earth, shara prithibi, it, it was long back in 1934. And Rovindra, almost contemporary in 1934, in its said, Probably we are, we are reaching towards the destruction. So, global average atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, if you look, it, it, in 2019, it was nearly 410 ppm. It never exceeded 300 ppm during last 8 lakh years. And sea level rising continuously, currently, uh, along the coastal belt of the, of the Earth, about 680 million people are living. Only if you look at our, our, our Sundarbans, about 4.5 million people are threatened who are living along the coastal bay of, of, of Bengal. And warming of the globe, uh, it is alarming. Uh, I, I was looking at the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, last report. It's and they, We have fixed a target that 1.5 degree uh, by the end of this uh, by mid this century, but we believe that this is not possible to achieve. Our our it may reach even two three degree plus since the pre-industrial level. So this alarming rise of temperature is also impacting our ecosystem. This is the background what I am discussing to you, and as case study I will also go to the Sundarbon and to explain further. This is Sundarbon. Uh, we have experienced a devastating cyclone uh, about a few days back. It is an area which is what we call ecologically sensitive area. It's a huge mangrove forest. 
uh, along the southern littoral coast of Bengal. And um, since late 18th century, western part of the Sundarbon was deforested. What happened there on? Sundarbon estuaries and rivers and water courses into the vast number of islands. Official records say that the 54 islands were deforested during the colonial period for human habitation. But if you count right at this moment, how many islands are being inhabited or people are, have settled so far, it is not more than 33. Because many islands are clubbed together now because of the decay of the intervening uh, channels. Uh, there are many other islands on, in the forested part. The crow flying length of the coastline of Sundarbon from Ganga Shagar to Haria Bhanga border is about 120 kilometers. And Sundarbon sprays over 9,630 square kilometers in India and 16,370 square kilometers in Bangladesh. Indian Sundarbon is further divided into two parts. One is reclaimed part and other is non-reclaimed or forested part. And eastern part, about 4,262 square kilometer, is covered with dense mangrove. It is the home of about 4.5 million people. Problem is that this land is premature. This land is the active part of the delta. Uh, and this land is only two to four meter above mean, mean sea level. But the, the tidal amplitude, tidal surge, maybe five, six meter, and even it is maybe eight, nine meters during the cyclonic storm surge. So this area is newly built, the most youngest part of the, of the earth, where the colonial rulers, uh, settle some people and they are now surviving with, with uh, many difficulties. The premature land reclamation of Sundarbans, that is the deforestation, started since late 18th century. I told that 54 islands were completely deforested. The creeks were then embanked. To prevent the submergence of the floodplain during high tide, what they did, they cleared the forest and then build the linear embankment along the river. This means that Sundarbon creeks are not rivers in true sense of term. They are tidal creeks, meaning that they, twice in 24 hours, they spill off, they widen during the high tide, and then again shrinks. But unfortunately, the embankments, they, when they built, the intertidal space, intertidal space means the area between low tide and high tide was also encroached. That means that the embankments were built at such location, which is more or less along the low tide line. This reduced the cross-sectional area of the river, reduced the water holding capacity of the river, and more important is it compelled the rivers to deposit the sediment load on the riverbed, which earlier spilled off. So gradually, the cross-sectional area reduced and water level went high. Right at this moment, if you go to Sundarbon, and if you are in a vessel, you will find that you are far above the level of the, the, of, of the adjoining floodplain. Difference may be somewhere two meters. So this embankments, which were initially built by the uh, Britishers and subsequently continued by the state irrigation departments, are now treated as the lifeline of, 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 the, of, of, of Sundarbon. But they have enormous ecological, enormous ecological impact. If you look at this map, I was preparing this map, Sundarbon was up to this level, this line. Look at my cursor. And it covered in undivided Bengal about 20, more than 20,000 square kilometers. In, it is in 1780 when James Reynolds surveyed Bengal. Subsequently, when Tassin surveyed Bengal in 1841, 
it was reduced to 700, 745 square kilometer. Now, if you consider the satellite image, it is only 6,169 square kilometer in Bangladesh and 4 to 66 square kilometer in India. Together, it is only about 10,435 square kilometer. So what had been 20, more than 20,000 square kilometer is now reduced to about 10,000. So about 50% of the forest cover we have so far lost. This means also we have lost enough of biodiversity. And the, the natural land building process by the deposition of the sediment load by the process of spill up of the tidal creeks was also interrupted by the embankment building. Look at this, a, 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 just a schematic diagram. Schematic diagram, say this is the low tide line and this is the high tide line. And this is a embankment. And here is the village, here is the agricultural land. If you just imagine that, if you extend the high tide line up to westward, to a landward side, that means not only the village, but also the agricultural land will be submerged. This should not be. Earlier, it had been, river had been at lower level and land had been at higher level. But since we embanked this on both banks, the river was compelled to deposit the sediment load and resulting the reduction of the cross-sectional area. And now the position is that the river remains at higher level than the agricultural field and even the village when the river is at high tide. So when embankment is breached or it is over top during the cyclonic storms are, as it happened during last cyclone, yes, everything is devastated. Whenever the cyclonic land storms landfall is synchronized with high tide as it happened this year, this year, the peak high tide at Shagor was at 9.21 a.m. in the morning. Almost in the same time, the cyclone, cyclone uh, landform synchronized with it. Result was that from Digha to Sundarbon, everywhere the coastline was submerged and large number of people were displaced. If you look at this picture, you look at this, this is not exactly a high tide line. This is the light embankment. This is the embankment. And the river level is almost at the house level, at, at, at the rooftop level. So, so a breaching of the embankment is very, very common in, in Sundarbon, as we in, are informed that large area uh, in, in last cyclone is either breached or the water overtop. Sea surface temperature uh, is in ever increasing. The global average sea surface temperature increase is recorded as 0.5 degree. Sea surface temperatures in Sundarbon is increasing at the rate of 0.5 degree centigrade per decade, while global observed SST sea surface temperature warming is only 0.06 degree centigrade per decade. Sea level is undoubtedly rising. Uh, at the rate, at which rate? It is far above the global average. Usundarban has a complex problem of land subsidence. The subsidence of land due to auto compaction of the sediment load and is at the rate of 2.9 millimeter per year. And sea level rise is 3.6 millimeter per year. If you clap together, that means Effective sea level rise will be 6.5 millimeter per year in Bay of Bengal. The result is that sea is continuously encroaching and there is an increasing tendency of cyclone formation. So far, 79 cyclones have devastated Sundarbans since 1901. The major cyclones which recently visited Sundarbans are Isla, I believe you can remember, Bulbul, 2019, Amphad, 2020 and years 2021. Look at this data. The gap between Isla and Bulbul is about a decade, 10 years. But subsequently, 
we find every year we are getting one cyclone and it is it is sometimes more disastrous than the previous one what happened in, in case of years you know years has a landfall the eye of the cyclone uh, touched the dhamra port of urissa at about 9 a.m. in the morning and it has a huge anti clockwise circuit anti clockwise circuit with having a radius of about 275 square kilometer reaching up to the border of the indo bangladesh border and it moves in anti clockwise way and unfortunately when landfall completed between 9 to 11 am it was the time when the tide was at highest level the massive destruction at digha sagor moushuni namkhana fraser gorge was due to the synchronization of the high tide and the cyclonic landfall and i told you the average height of the land is only 2 to 4 meter while cyclonic storms are sometimes reached far above this so the water logging destruction displacement homelessness was common across the uh, indian coast it is often debated that concrete embankment may ensure better safety but such structure uh, built along the coast proved futile i will show you some pictures the construction of embankment beyond intertidal space allowing the river to spill off during the high tide may offer better safety we also believe that if we can plant mangrove in the intertidal space that can also give an additional safety and we can also think for regulated spill of self led water to raise the level of flood plain uh, in some some selected cases the wall of mangrove in the intertidal space both along the coast and along the river may offer additional security i i will like to share some of the pictures look at one of the cyclone which i experienced earlier this is the fury of the cyclone and it huge it overtops the embankment it destroys everything sometimes reaches the top of the of a coconut tree i will show you what, what kind of disasters it can invite look at this this is the sea coast embankment it was built with mud subsequently some brick capping was given it breached everything look at this this is said to be concrete embankment but it was also breached a kind of structure which was extended into the sea to deflect the wave but it failed i took this picture from namkhana uh, i i sorry from mohsuni island and then further beyond uh, g plot and other areas of the i will also show the distress of the people look at this and this is another picture this and this is the destruction uh, which touched our heart and it it temporarily displaces large number of people and if you can look at this map this is very interesting what i was do doing i was looking at how much sea has encroached during last 250 years or so this is the coastline uh the you see this is the island that is an extension of sagor island in 1780 sagor island was a cluster of about 6 7 islands in fact ghoramara which appears to be uh, many people are afraid that it will disappear uh, and it has loha chora supari bhanga betford see other islands along it all have disappeared and ghoramara is going to be disappeared and you look at this sea has encroached from here to here about 8 km and the ganga sagar temple local people say it has retreated several times and the present one is also said to be threatened this is this year's picture you can see the beach of the embankment 
you can see the overtopping of the embankment. So this kind of embankment when uh, is really, really proved futile against the against the fury of the nature. The main conclusion, this man I met at at a southern point of Moshui, his name is Ayub Khan. He look at this. Here had been the embankment. He built a hut on, on the embankment. The sea has encroached further. He still lived there, but right at this moment, he is not living there. He is compelled to migrate elsewhere. He has lost his homeland, his agricultural land, and everything. So this encroaching sea is continuously creating a class of neo-refugees who are being displaced by the large by the continuously encroaching sea. So we must think about the long-term planning. And I'm 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 I am I have read in the newspaper that government of West Bengal is going to constitute an expert committee. And that expert committee will be advised to prepare a long-term sustainable planning for Sundarbon. How we can save not only the forest but also the 4.5 million people living there all. It is really, really a difficult challenge. The, we are continuing a colonial legacy because the land, it's, even till date, is not fit for human habitation. It is only 2.2 to 4 meter above mean cell level. Tidal surge may go up to 5, 6 meter. So if there is no impact, nothing like that, the entire Sundarbon will be submerged under a depth of water of about one meter. So how to save these people? How to save the property? How to uh, protect their livelihood? And how to protect the ecosystem as well as biodiversity? This seems to be the most serious challenge. The, the, what the government of India is going to constitute an interdisciplinary committee uh, and that will work out and they will suggest what is the possible remedial measures. I really, really understand it is a most difficult challenge. Uh, with these few words, I stop here. Thank you all for your patient hearing and giving me a chance to interact with you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And I'm sure there are questions. And uh, this is something that actually, uh, you expressed your passion towards the work, which I mentioned to you always uh, connect this development and sustainability. And that's what being reflected in your lecture also. And I'm sure the students will understand that these are the major demand for future. Whatever we do, we have to think about the sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was indeed a very um, involving, I would say, presentation, Dr. Rudro. Uh, really so much, so much to learn. And uh, we are so helpless at times. I would request uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Devashish Gongopadhyay, he is uh, Director for Natural Science at Sister Nivedita University. Uh, Professor Gongopadhyay, would you like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Rudro uh, any question? Ma'am, can you unmute him? I have, I have. Yes, Professor Gongopadhyay, uh, you can unmute yourself. Yes. yes. Namaskar, Kalanda. Namaskar. Ah, <laughs> How are you? That uh, you are speaking. Yes. Being here, I have, uh, as you said, this entire thing to some extent is because of the colonial legacy, right? That yes. these embankments essentially decrease the cross section of the river, and as there was a silting, and the silt makes the level go high. Now, can't this be reversed? Uh, yes, this is a very important question. Uh, uh, Professor Wangobada, please let us, let us keep in mind that we are trying to repair the nature after long 250 years. Mm. The, the, uh, 
the Sundarban reclamation started about 1780. And when embankments were built, subsequently we continued, we carry forward that colonial legacy. The Sundarban, we have a misconception about this, that these are not referred in two sense of term. That means refer is generally one way, having one way flow in its non-tidal regime. Say Ganga, Ganga from Gomuk to about Navodip, it flows uh, one way, continuously toward the sea. But in the tidal regime, the creeks of Sundarbon, there are about 13 creeks across Indo-Bangladesh territory. These are all funnel shaped. Funnel shaped, I mean, it is white on the southern front and gradually tapering northwards. Say, Hubli estuary along the Sagor has a width of about 37 kilometer, and it is being reduced to about two kilometer near Diamond Harbor. And in Kolkata, it is it is about 300, uh, 300 meter. So it is tapering northward. And in case of Sundarbon, the creeks are having no upstream supply. Upstream supply means that no water flows downstream through the Sundarbon teeth, except a few, except a few. These creeks are what we call beheaded. So tide enters and low tide water goes down. During the high tide, water flows north and during the low tide, it, it flows south. That is means a two-way traffic, two-way flow. And there is a tide velocity asymmetry. Tide velocity asymmetry means the tide, high tide, water flows very fast, carrying huge sediment, suspended sediment load, which we often forget. We think that river as the, are the conduit of flowing water, but river carries sediment load, river carries the biodiversity, and it also carries suspended solid and, and many other nutrients too. What was the natural process of Sundarbon creeks? It widened twice in 24 hours during high tide. Twice been during two high tide during 24 hours, it widened spill of the intertidal space. But when we snatched the intertidal space from the river, making it narrow, river, I said that it was compelled to deposit the sediment load on the river. Your question is very, very interesting and pertinent. Can we can we reverse the process? That is, right at the moment, river at high, the land surrounding is low. Only way is that we need to allow some regulated spill. We can't withdraw all embankments. If we withdraw all embankments, it will totally be submerged, displacing 4.5 million people. So what we can do we can allow some regulated spill that is intentionally allowing the silt laden water to enter on the adjoining floodplain. It will be encircled by a circuit embankment, allowing to deposit the sediment load thereon. I have seen that a single tide can leave behind two centimeter layer of sediment load. So you just imagine after 10, 20 years, that land will be elevated. And we we can we can we will have to make an holistic plan. But problem is that almost entire Sundarbon is somehow or other occupied, either by the in the form of agricultural land or in the form of human habitation. So getting this kind of land for regulated spill, allowing the river to deposit its sediment load on the floodplain, I understand it is difficult, but it is required. It is required also. Uh, I believe expert committee will also consider this issue. Mm. Am I clear, Professor Gangopadha? Thank you. Thank you, yes. thank you uh, <laughs> Professor Gangopadha, and thank you, Dr. Rudro, for really charting that out answer. Uh, well, uh, I would now request, I can see him, uh, Professor Monish Chakraborty. He is a principal for our School of Architecture. Are you there, Professor Chakraborty? I, can, I did see you a couple of minutes ago. Uh, I, 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 I think yes, he's, he is here. He's here. Yes, I know he's here, but I, I, I can't see his video is not uh, on. So maybe 
Okay, we'll take a few questions in yeah, then we can get back to the question. Debussy's question is very interesting. Yes, yes, yes. yes. We'll take a few questions. Uh, well, this is from uh, Debussy Mukherjee, uh, Professor Dr. Debussy Mukherjee. She's, of course, the HOD of our law department at SNUSA. Uh, do you think that something in the form of an environmental cess will make us aware about our commitment towards the environment? Uh, it's a legal question, I understand. <laughs> I'm always afraid of lawyers. <laughs> uh, 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 question is that there is a question postal jewel regulations. And I must admit that everywhere postal jewel regulation is being flouted. The ideal example is Mandarmuni. West Bengal Pollution Control Board uh, issued the closure order for about 24, 25 hotels, which have encroached the intertidal space. But the order was not implemented. I'm happy to know that this year, after this devastating cyclone, Chief Minister has said that this is illegal, this needs to be removed. The environmental compensation is an important issue, which has allowed West Bengal Pollution Control Board by the Honorable NGT. Honorable NGT in an order said that West Bengal Pollution Control Board has liberty to uh, impose environmental compensation um, says on the violator. But this is applicable to uh, the industries who emit uh, em emission beyond permissible limit or discharge the polluted effluent out of its, its factory premises. This can can also be applicable to uh, any violator, individual, causing environmental pollution of the Environment Protection Act 1985 or Water Act, 1980, uh, uh, Water Act 1974 and the Air Act 1981. Yes, we have the liberty, but uh, regarding this uh, encroachment in the restricted areas of Sundarbon, I believe the imposing tax and allowing them to continue is not legally correct, nor environmentally correct. So this should be removed I first, I think. That nature must have its own space. The rivers must, the sea must have its own space to operate. This area uh, should not be encroached upon by the society, the human society. Yes, thank you, sir, for that answer. Uh, well, there's another question from uh, Shomitra Chakraborty. Is it possible that we can uh, to implement uh, the Netherlands model of storm defense and flood prevention to save uh, the Sundarbans? Uh, this question I also frequently face. First, let us admit that be it freshwater flood, be it saline water storm surge, total freedom from flood is neither possible, I believe not desirable to. Nature must have its operating space. Say a case of the Ganga, the flood, Ganga flood. The Ganga reaches the, its peak, peak during July, August, September, particularly in September. And at that point of time, it overtop its bank and some more the adjoining flood plain. Are you there? Yes, 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 sir. Dr. Rudra, continue. So the same thing, the storm surge or tidal submergence in the coastal tract is a, is a, is a land building process. The freshwater flood, they, when they spill off the bank, they deposit the fertile sediment load on the agricultural field. But the normal tide in the, in the coastal belt of Sundarban or littoral tract, when they spill off, they also deposit the sediment load. So this is a natural land building process. If you don't allow this natural build, land building process, the land will continue to remain premature, unfit for human habitation. 
so some kind of spill of uh, of silt laden water must be allowed so that natural process of land building can continue we are living in this largest delta of the world ganga brahmaputra system carries highest sediment load in the world to the tune of about 100 billion tons per year this sediment load is continuously pushed back by the tide and they, this needs to be deposited on the flood plain so that land can be built up okay um thank you um, dr rudra we'll take one another question from uh, uh dr shushmita dhor actually um second i'll just scroll down yes whether environmentally uh, whether environmentally sound technology will help us in maintaining sustainability and protecting our environment can actually environmentally sound technology help us uh, i'm really at this age i'm sometimes confused what is the environmentally sound technology say one example that we introduced green revolution technology in mid 1960s and the food production of india definitely increased from about 60 million tons per year to about 70 million tons what we did we used indiscriminately chemical fertilizers pesticides and exploited groundwater damped our river system result was somehow the increase of the food crop but the biodiversity loss was enormous decay of river system was enormous and depletion of the groundwater table so we'll have to understand what are the rule of nature that i was talking uh, at the initial part of my lecture so we are the only living creature who produce food other all other creatures are food gatherers and our demand is ever increasing so nature has its limit nature has its limits i i also told that our ecological footprint is ever increasing so we will have to look it in other way that is our demand side management is important not supply side management because nature cannot supply enormous amount of uh, uh, the component what we demand our demand should be reduced and so that the nature we are balanced delicately balanced with the nature oindila oindila i think there's another question from uh, dr debushri mukherji she says dr rutu she says um, will you please share some of the recent initiatives that uh, west bengal pollution control board has undertaken in recent times yes sure sure so what we are doing my first priority is air quality management uh earlier it was very weak the government of india has declared 122 cities as what they call non attainment city including delhi kolkata howrah etc etc uh these cities the air quality particularly during winter is not within the permissible limit so what we did a list came to us we have seven non attainment cities that are kolkata howrah barakpur holdia durgapur asansol raniganj we are going to to build an extensive network of the air quality monitoring monitoring starting from kuchbihar down to sundarbans unfortunately by lockdown our work is somehow prevented so we presently we have a network of about 95 air quality monitoring stations that will be increased many times and that this data is being sh shared in the public domain constantly we have signed a memorandum of understanding with iit delhi and also national environmental engineering research institute they have started research that is the first they identified the sources of pollution second 
one important issue which was not, not which was beyond our knowledge is the transboundary pollution issue that is the pollution coming from outside bengal carried by the northerly wind and we have started to take regulatory actions one such action is we started to switch over requesting switch over all roadside eateries of the kolkata those who are burning or using solid fuel to switch over to cleaner fuel we have so far distributed more than 3000 gas oven and more about 100 or or even more uh, iron to the to the istri walas those who had, who had been burning the solid fuels to improve the air quality of the kolkata during the winter we regularly sprinkling sprinkle water on the, on the on the on the roads of kolkata to suppress the dust not only in kolkata but all seven are uh, not in many cities secondly after the amphan we lost many trees west bengal pollution control board is taking took an initiative of regreening kolkata and its adjoining area and we have planted so far about 1700 17000 plants and they those each of the plants are geotagged so so that in such a way from our office we can understand what is the present status of that second issue is that solid waste management solid waste management you know there are 107 legacy dump site in west bengal one such is at dhapa other at probon nagar dia dakhineshwar mullar bheri and many others so we have started bio mining of this legacy dump sites this means disintegration of the waste and recycle them maybe composting maybe paper block building and many other so that waste is properly recycled and regarding the covid waste management it is it is actually waste management is the, is is the issue of the urban local body but we are the regulatory authority and we are keeping the gps tracking of the of this waste management from collection to disposal other issue is the ganga pollution and other river management we have about 139 monitoring stations all over the state and we in case of ganga we monitor the water quality from jongipur or, or rather farakka down to jaimon harbor twice in a month and that data is regularly being uploaded in our website we also have a poribesh app you can just go to google uh, play store and download the poribesh app and you can all look at this data you can download this data from our website and go on research it more important is that we have a public grieving center and anybody living anywhere in west bengal can lodge a complaint and we have one uh, uh, committee called uh, public grieving system and redressal committee headed by a district judge he takes care of everything so these are the actions we are precisely taking uh, recently the top priority of definitely the air quality management and i am happy to uh, announce here that air quality of kolkata had been better than the preceding three winters because of the several actions taken by the west bengal pollution control board and other government department you can also see that the e vehicles are operating in kolkata i we hope the cng will will reach this town uh, by the end of this month and it will be pipeline connectivity uh, from from upper india coming to kolkata thank you now nah, those are some view of good news thank you <laughs> um definitely uh, hope we are definitely hopeful as the citizen of the state sir uh I, we have almost come uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, that was indeed a very uh, grossing lecture, I would say. And uh, right now, I would uh, request our uh, uh, Mrs. Ina Bose, uh, Director HR, Corporate Communication and Industry Connect at Sister Nivedita University, to give the formal word. Thank you, Indrila. 
Dr. Rudra, I have no words to express my gratitude uh, for agreeing to uh, deliver this talk. And of course, uh, again, my gratitude to uh, Professor Monish Chakubutti. Uh, although uh, he has left, uh, I understand he's got some medical emergency at home, so he has left uh, this uh, program. But I'm really grateful for him to connect me uh, with you. Uh, Dr. Rudro, uh, uh, let me share. Ma'am, if I can interrupt, I think uh, Professor Chakrabutti is here. He's raising his hand. Oh, really? So he's really, back again. Really. Okay. Oh, Thank then you. Let, Thank let him talk first. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, I, I uh, definitely... Uh, if he's here? Uh, yes, Professor yeah, he Chakrabutti. Uh, he's, of course, the principal for architecture at Sister Nivedita University. Uh, Professor Chakrabutti, we can hear you. I am deeply... Uh, I, I have to go in between because our... Um, uh, Monish, your voice is not very clear. Okay, I had to go in between. I I I I, I couldn't uh, follow through the whole presentation, but the first half was uh, mind gripping, and particularly Sundarbans, where I also visited quite a number of times for my projects in Bali Island, um, um, which is a very successful during the time of Isla. I remember uh, that was the only. Uh, resort that I built, which was uh, still not submerged, and Kanti Ganguly at that point of time was stationed there, um, operating and doing all kinds of help that was needed at the time of uh, the cyclone. Um, but I had gone there and I found what fragile ecosystem uh, that that is, both culturally and environmentally, um, and uh, how man and environment coexist in that, in that place. Um, I personally, as an architect, um, always felt that uh, uh, the, the environmental concerns of um, building new buildings instead of restoring an existing building um, is, is a huge environmental reason um, to, to adopt as a state policy. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I, though the remit of heritage is primarily on the, on the level of information and cultural affairs, but I think it has got an environmental component that by not breaking a building and adapting the building, if it is, and retrofitting the building, um, it can actually be a huge environmental plus and a lot of carbon footprint um, uh, could be, could be, could be uh, uh, okay. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and here I would like to have your thoughts, Dr. Woodrow, which is completely uh, out of um, uh, the mainstream environmental studies. And um, do you think that it's a good idea to also include the concerns of protection, the way we talk about protection of wetlands, uh, in the environmental department can also talk about the protection of old buildings and places in the city of Kolkata and, and, and the nation. A lot of countries have adopted this as a part of the environmental concern. Dr. Rudro, I would like to I would like to have your uh, say uh, and, and your thoughts because I felt that this is though an insignificant component to the environmental concern and protection that is necessary, but do you think this can also be an agenda of the, of the, of the environmental concern of, of a state or a nation? Dr. Rudra, if you can unmute yourself, please. I'm a very unsp unsmart guy, so I forget often. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I, I, I uh, Professor Chakraborty, I could not follow the last words you spoke, but some kind of audio problem had been here. Can yeah. you repeat, please? My, my concern is a very limited point that. Uh, Though environmental concerns of the 
uh, environment department has been by and large in the mainstream. But do you think cultural restoration, restoration of buildings uh, could also come under the forte of environmental department and not necessarily only, uh, only memory restoration, uh, but also an environmental concern that needs to be taken on board by the environment. Uh, Professor Chakraborty, you must know that, that uh, there is a committee called ACAC, and there is a two-tier committee uh, which uh, we offer logistics support. Uh, it is constituted by the gadget notification of the government of India. Any housing project covering more than twenty thousand square kilometer uh, is forwarded to our end for environmental clearance. Yes. Anything less than that is not our consideration. And you know, we um, issue some terms of reference and ultimately the environmental clearance after clearance from those two committee is right. issued by the environment uh, department. Right. Uh, so uh, the large housing projects right. covering more than 20,000 square kilometer is uh, comes to our end, but anything less than that is not our domain. <laughs> right, right, right. You think for the case of Heritage buildings, because the embodied energy in an old building is huge. To break that, you also lose a lot of energy. Uh, do you think that particular area stipulation for heritage buildings and places can be brought down? Uh, a classic example of, of this issue is the central vista. Uh, it is being constructed at the cost of, I read in the newspaper, many heritage building. <laughs> uh, and it is at the point of time uh, when large number of people are suffering for oxygen right. and many uh, dead bodies are floating down the uh, river Ganga. Uh, mm. uh, Professor Chakraborty, uh, I mm, mm, once or rather many times I was called by the, our former governor, uh, Gopal Krishna Gandhi. Uh, uh, he liked me. Uh, and we had a series of discussion many times. Once he told, he came to our office to inaugurate uh, one of the report of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, on climate change. He started his lecture in the way, I, I, I keep it quote unquote, he said, governor has no right to inaugurate the, the report of the IPC Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. Because whenever he moves, he moves with a convoy of at least six cars emitting CO2. <laughs> and he went back to Raj Bhavan and reduced the number of convoy, only two cars he had been using. He once said, go and look at my cabinet. The industry minister is always very high-handed man. And look at the unfortunate environment minister. He is always back backbencher. But this should be otherwise reversed. <laughs> this was his understanding. One of the finest gentlemen, one of yes. the finest yes. governor I have ever seen. Yes. yes. Immediately and, after and, and, and since, since you are a teacher, and at the end of the day, I would like to share one of my experience. The first phone call, I received from Raj Bhavan was, I, if my memory serves me, it was in 2006. His secretary said, the governor wants to meet you. He wants an appointment from your end. I mean, tell him he's the governor of the state. I can go whenever he likes. Uh, the day, the appointment was fixed in the next day. I went to Raj Bhavan. Someone took me to his library. He came forward and shook hand with me and said, I'm very sorry, Kulat. I mean, why? I, I have called you. I mean, so what? You are the governor of the state. You have liberty to call any citizen of the state. Well, no, you are a teacher. A student should go to the teacher. It is, it is the respect which a teacher deserves. Yeah. And I wish to touch his feet, but we could not. Uh, he's an outstanding yeah. gentleman. Outstanding yeah. gentleman. I had the honor of taking the governor on a heritage walk along the Dalhousie Square immediately yes. after he came. 
In fact, we organized the workshop that time. Orun Bhattacharya was the information and cultural affairs secretary. Yes. And, uh, and we actually did a um, fantastic workshop of protecting the Delauzi Square as a protected zone from any further development happening in that zone. Um, and uh, that's, that's when he came and gave his first lecture, public lecture after assuming office in 2016 or uh, 2006. And it was fantastic. His understanding was fantastic. Um, I, 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 I really enjoyed, but I couldn't stay in between. Um, and uh, who else but you could actually um, um, uh, kind of mark the onset of World Environment Day, um, which is tomorrow. Um, and we are very fortunate. And Inadi will, uh, will, will, will conclude, uh, I think, by, by, by saying all that. But I'm extremely happy that we could get you. And we would like you to come and, 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 and take some lectures when we are away from, um, uh, from the pandemic. Thank you so much. Dr. Rudro, I have a few um, uh, observations, or you may say uh, a few requests. Uh, the message for the next gen, uh, probably like, for instance, you mentioned uh, about the Poribesh app. How many of us really know about this or how many of the next gen uh, citizens are aware? Uh, so maybe WBPCB should come forward uh, having more awareness programs in schools, in colleges, universities, uh, so that uh, the next gen are fully equipped with all this uh, knowledge expertise. That's one. Uh, secondly, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Chattopadhyay, and myself, and I'm sure Monish too, we are very passionate about green buildings. Uh, don't you think that uh, the, there should be some uh, uh, government uh, measures to make uh, the, the upcoming buildings? Uh, Monish was talking about the heritage ones. Well, I'm talking about the upcoming ones that they have to, it's a compulsory uh, compulsion. They have to uh, come up with green buildings, whichever level, whichever, uh, I mean, certification or from whichever body, but it should be a must that they come up with uh, uh, the green building concept. Uh, can't these be made compulsory? Only the, um, uh, hardly how many uh, green buildings do we have in Calcutta? Uh, I don't think uh, more than a dozen, Munish. And uh, that too, I don't think any residential building here is uh, a green building a few commercial buildings and hotels. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, that green building movement, uh, then certification of green buildings has started about a very recent phenomena, um, about 15, 20 years now. Uh, but that's a very imminent, what you mentioned about um, um, pollution control board um, giving um, certification for new building, uh, which grows above a particular area, isn't it, sir? Yeah. Uh, yes, but housing complexes, housing, uh, even the residential big buildings, the high rises um, are huge. They are also probably might cross that uh, uh, area. Madam, can I clarify? Yes, please, uh, sir. First one is that, yes, uh, people have a gross misunderstanding about the pollution control board. We are running with skeleton staff. Believe me, the full-time staff of West Bengal Pollution Control Board is a little over 100. We have 11 regional offices. We are largely relying on our contractual uh, staff. They are very efficient, but uh, we have problem of staff. This is point number one. We have a network of about uh, what we call green core uh, crop school uh, 5,600 schools we have a network of. Say, um, tomorrow's program of the World Environment Day, which will be celebrated in the world, uh, in, the, in our auditorium, will be online and it will have the Facebook uh, 
connecti- uh, sorry, uh, 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 online connectivity has already been shared to many. It will be it will be online live program. Because of this this COVID situation, we have restricted the uh, uh, visit of of the even the uh, journalist to our office. Lastly, coming to that heritage building and the green building, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, Madam, we are guided by acts and rules, and that too is governed by the government of India. Not that West Bengal Pollution Control Board has a liberty to decide anything. we are guided by say water act air act ep act and environment act of 2006 mm. so this guideline is clearly specific and even our powers and our periphery is decided by the act so mm, uh, it is not our liberty to grant anything mm. i understand sir that is why i mentioned that it has to it's a uh, uh, earnest appeal to the government that the government should be more sensitive in uh, extending such uh, alterations in the act i don't know maybe and as for your skeleton staff you mentioned sir uh, we are there to volunteer you Your, uh, for <laughs> yeah. your work for your organization my students are there uh, yeah. you just uh, let us know our students will rush to uh, work as volunteers oh. yeah sure i will keep touch yes please uh, keep us in mind and uh, we'll be happy to uh, i'm sure uh, under the leadership of monish a big group of students can uh, work as volunteers for your uh, wbpcd the architects increasingly work on environmental issues um i have seen architects in other countries where the water issues are being solved or been addressed through architectural intervention architectural intervention need not be always with mass concrete it can also be very systematic uh, sorry to disturb uh, yeah. can we wrap up actually because uh, i think the time limit is been yes. crossed yes yeah so yes we will uh, but uh, yeah. yeah we will uh, thank you dr rudra uh once again i join uh, professor chatrobadhyay and monish and all my uh, students and faculty members here to invite you to visit our university when once things uh, are normal and uh, maybe uh, i don't know whether you have visited our campus uh, so we would like to have you at our campus sure so sure meet uh, our students meet our faculty talk to them uh, yeah. we will be delighted sir पैसा His regards and uh, sent his uh, yes. best wishes to you to me. Convey my regards to him. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank I'm you. I'm not picking a thug book. I'll be. I'll be eating chaat a cup. Yeah, sure, sure. Namaskar. So I'm good. Namaskar. 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 Namask